fast the my car since the my earlier son chit this college all school in Vannin, so the lecture on Noch, this time we fear man yet to be Chris Callow and Chen studied um Mary Noch um to discuss his uh dissertation. So please welcome um Chris Callow and uh, a warm welcome to University College of Man, excuse me. Wondering with my mouth tonight. Um, Chris is a former advocate and a blue badge guide, as many of you will know. He has his own uh, guiding company, Island Heritage Tours. He's also a former student of mine. Um, he's a former student of mine uh, who graduated last year with a first class degree in history and heritage from University College Island Man. Now, in his final year dissertation, he put into practice his previous experience as an advocate. Um, exploring the history of Max Land's tenure and particularly in relation to intact farms. So I'm really <coughs> pleased he's agreed to come and speak with us this evening to share his research. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you for that welcome. I'm astonished to see how many share my interest in intacts and I hope that interest will be as strong by the time I've finished. <laughs> These are the questions I'm going to be exploring this evening. What is INTAC? Why were some upland farms classed as INTAC? How did this make them different from other farms? And what was the status of INTAC, the, of the owners of INTAC farms? So I'm going to start with a definition. The Oxford English Dictionary equates INTAC with INTAKE, which it defines as a piece of land taken in from more land, common, um, and an enclosure. So who's interested in intax? Historians, possibly. Lawyers, certainly. A few lawyers here tonight. Uh, also farmers. I spoke about my research to a friend who uh, worked on a farm in Kirk Michael, and he knew exactly where the intax on that particular farm were, although he couldn't say exactly what they were. So we're going to have to go into some legalities, although I will try and keep this as light as possible. As you've heard, I practiced as a Manx advocate for 20 years. The training for the law on the island involves learning general principles of English law and then forgetting a lot of them and learning where Manx law differed. And I can safely say it's in land law that there are the greatest differences, although they have been watered down somewhat in recent years. In my time in practice, I was never happier than when looking into title to land. These days, we have a modern land registration system. And when you've bought your new home, you get a pretty certificate and a plan to show you what you own. But prior to the Land Registration Act 1982, what you got was much more satisfying, a big fat abstract of title, which if you were lucky, contained copies of summaries of deeds going back 100 years or more tracing the ownership of the land back down the years. And if you were particularly lucky, you'd find a strange shorthand representing entries in what are called the manorial rolls. Now, many of you here will be familiar with the manorial rolls, but not all of you. So I'll spend a little time explaining these. The starting point is that until comparatively recently, land on the island was held as an estate of inheritance. You could, with the Lord's consent, sell it during your lifetime, but if you didn't, it passed automatically to your heir at law, who was your eldest son, if you had sons, or in default, your eldest daughter, or some other close relation. All land was subject to a Lord's rent, which was a fixed sum, payable annually, which by the 16th century had replaced goods in kind. Now, there had been great anxiety in the 17th century when the earls of Derby had sought to replace customary estates with fixed leases. This was eventually resolved in the Act of Settlement of 1702, under which customary estates were confirmed. But the rents of the principal farm estates were doubled and payments introduced on transfer of land called alienation fines. Now, following this doubling of the rents, the Lord's rents remained unchanged until ab abolished in the early 20th century. The Lords of Man needed to be sure that the revenues were properly collected, so the rents were written down in lists, parish by parish. In 
and we're very fortunate that these lists have survived from the early 16th century right through to 1911 when the rents were abolished. And so we have an invaluable resource to trace ownership of land back down the centuries. This evening I'll be talking about two sets of these records, called in shorthand Lib Acid and Lib Vast. Liber Acidationis translates as the setting book. For any given year, it contains a list of occupiers who were described as tenants and the rents paid by them. In early years, these lists are annual. In later years, they were compiled about every 10 years. These lists were later bound together in parish order, north side records being originally held at Peel and south side records kept at Castletown. At this point, we need to consider how land on the island is divided. At the top level, we have six sheedings, which are the nearest equivalent to English shires. And on this map, the six sheedings are shown in bold text. They're still relevant today. They're the basis of rural constituencies in the House of Keys elections, and also the governor still appoints coroners for each sheeding. Or these days, a coroner is appointed for more than one sheeding. Each sheeting is divided into parishes, of which there are 17. So historically, all except one sheeting contained three parishes. You can see, for example, the sheeting of Eyre in the north were the parishes of Lazare, Andreas and Bride. Before the development of the towns, parish, uh, civil parishes and ecclesiastical parishes had roughly the same boundaries. Civil parishes are still important for local government purposes outside towns and the governor still appoints captains of the parishes whose duties are largely ceremonial. At different times, legislation has changed the distribution of the parishes between the sheedings, but that doesn't affect the farms that I'm going to be talking about tonight, which lie in the parish of Lazare, the sheeding of Eyre, the parish of Graddon, in the sheeting of Middle, excuse my shaking hand, and the parish of Michael in the sheeting of Michael. Have a look in particular at the long neck of uh, Braddon extending down <coughs> between Michael and Lazare towards Solby Reservoir, which is something we'll be returning to. And also note the north-south division. In fact, in the Isle of Man, it's a northeast to southwest division following the spine of hills that runs down the island. So in fact, in ancient times, Mackled, on which part of Ramsey is built, uh, is a south side parish, whereas Patrick down here is a north side parish. The parishes are divided into trines, up between 200 to 500 acres, and the trines are further divided into principal farmlands, which are called quarterlands, and they're between 50 and 180 acres. And it was these quarterlands that had their rents doubled under the Act of Settlement. Here's a useful graphic summarising these divisions. So going back to Lib Asset in 1515, which is the earliest surviving complete north side roll, in each parish the quarterlands are listed treen by treen in a set order. And if in a subsequent year a holding has become subdivided, then both tenants are shown, each being liable to pay a proportion of the rent of the whole. And because each successive list was prepared from the previous, we still see the same tree names being listed in 1911, the year of the final roll. The later rolls in the 19th century are very easy to read, but in earlier years they're quite difficult to decipher. First because they're in Latin, and then they're in a strange shorthand, Fortunately, an academic with the glorious name of Theophilus Talbot made a translation of the earliest rolls for 1511 and 1515, uh, which was published in 1924. Now, of course, while land stays the same, people come and go, so there had to be a way to record changes of ownership. And this brings in the second set of records, Lib Vast, Liber Vastorum, the Book of Waste. And these records were made every year at two sheeting courts held normally in May and October. And they recorded any change of tenant, 
the reason for the change and the money payment or fine that was due. Now, you're probably wondering why I haven't yet made any further mention of intac. That's because there is no intac in the earliest manorial roles. Nearly all land was either quarter land, for which rent was paid, or unenclosed land, mostly in the uplands, known as the Lord's Forest. This was used for summer grazing and the cutting of turf for fuel. But beginning in the 16th century, there came to be established a process whereby parcels of land could be enclosed. The procedure was to apply to the Lord's Governor for a licence. If this was granted, you then applied to a ju jury of 12 men called the Great Enquest, drawn from the parishes of your sheeding. They heard witnesses and visited the site to ensure there was no interference with rights of way or water or access to turbaries. Then at the sheeding court, a rent would be fixed and the intact would be entered on the roll for the parish. So from the middle of the 16th century, these intacts started to be listed in labour assets after quarterlands, but before cottages and mills. All this was dealt with exhaustively by Richard Shearwood, who wrote his invaluable treatise Manx Law Tenures uh, in the mid-19th century. <coughs> he contrasted quarterlands of inheritance which could not be left by will, but descended to the heir at law, with intacts, which could be left by will and could be arrested and sold to discharge debts. But once an intact had passed three times from generation to generation, it became inheritance land and was treated in the same way as quarter lands of inheritance. Now, by the 19th century, this was causing major problems with difficulty identifying what was quarter land and what was intact. 1869 saw two major reforms, the Real Property Act and the Wills Act. Under the former, all property was made liable to arrest and sale for debt, and by the latter, all property could be left by will. We're not all lawyers, that's all a bit dry, um, so let me lighten you with how I came to be interested in the subject of intax. I'm a callow, but my maternal grandmother was a cowley. And from an early age, it was impressed on me that she wasn't just a cowley, but she was a Cranach cowley. I wasn't sure what this meant, but one of the few family heirlooms to come down to us was a copy of Joseph Train's History of the Isle of Man from 1845. I believe I read some of it, but what made the greatest impression on me was the inscription on the flyleaf, John Cowley Cranach, 1867 in two scripts. Who was this Cowley and where was Cranach? Well, according to the family tree, he was my great-great-grandfather and Cranach was the family farm occupied by himself and his ancestors back at least to 1701. The buildings at Cranach had been derelict since the early 20th century and part of the land now lies submerged under the Solby Reservoir but with stout legs and lungs you can still visit, and it's a very beautiful place. My other prized possession is a copy of Wood's Atlas. Again, many of you will know what this is, some don't, and I'll give you a brief explanation. In the second half of the 19th century, the treatment of the mentally disordered was becoming a scandal with those adjudged insane, incarcerated in Castle Russian. Legislation was passed in 1860 to raise funds for the construction of an asylum by a rate levied on all farms on the island. Every landowner was required to deposit a plan of his land, which was then valued. The surveyor was James Wood, who went on to publish an atlas and gazetteer prepared from plans lodged under the Asylum Act or under the earlier Tithe Commutation Act. The atlas consists of hand-drawn maps for each parish, with every land holding shown, linked by numbers to a schedule of landowners. I don't know at what age I first looked into Wood's Atlas, but I do recall two emotions. Pride at John Cowley being listed as the owner of 44 acres, but peak at his farm at Cramog being shown as intact in yellow, rather than quarterland in pink. And you can see Cranach down at the extreme left-hand corner of this map of Lazare. 
The map shows graphically the extension of farmland up Solby Glen, with the pink quarter lands, the earliest uh, land, and the addition of intact holdings around. You can see intacts added to quarter lands, such as in Ballaskelia here and Thorty Whale here, as well as separate intact farms, such as Cranach, which are the properties I'm going to be talking about tonight. My grandmother also told me that prior to coming to Cramog, her ancestors had established the neighbouring farm of the Close in Braddon. So again, looking in Woods Atlas, this time in Braddon, I found a Thomas Cowley listed. Again, for an intact holding. Who was he, and was there a connection? So what I determined to do was to look back in time using the manorial rolls to try and find out how and when these holdings had come into being and how they'd been passed on from the earliest times. So let's have a look at the map, looking at the three farms I'll be discussing. Cranegg now is over on the right-hand side, close here, and this is the neck of Braddon extending down. And in the parish of Michael, a very large farm of Druidale. I started my research with Cranegg. As we saw, it's listed in Woods Atlas as intact number 34 in Lazare with an area of 44 acres, two roods and 29 perches. In case you want to know, an acre is 40 roods and a rood is 40 perches. Looking in the Lib Asset for Lazare in 1869, we can see, although probably not very clearly, John Cowley paying a three shilling rent. The process from there was to go back through all previous lib assets and identify the same three shilling rent. And I found it was always in a Cowley name as far back as 1589, which was the earliest entry I could find. This is the whole of the page um, in Lib Asset of 1589, which is one of the pages listing intact rents for Lazare. Not very easy to spot there. Um, there's an enlargement which helps a little. Um, and I do assure you that reads William Cowley, and the rent is given as three shillings. You'll see it's sixth from the end of the intacts listed in Lazare which suggests that Cranach was enclosed and added to the list of intacts shortly before the preparation of this roll. The roll before this is dated 1583, and there was no three shilling intact listed there. The next step was to look in Libvast at around that time to see if there was a record of the enclosure, but unfortunately there wasn't. So what dealings do we see with Cranach between 1583 and 1911. In September 1750, the owner of Cramig was one John Cowley. It's nearly always John Cowley, so you better get used to these. His son, also John, was planning to marry Jane Cottier, and the two families entered into a marriage settlement. John Jr. was to get all the father's land and houses, but only half initially, the other half on the death of the survivor of John Sr and his wife. Jump forward five years and John Jr. is married, but not to his original betrothed, to one Joni, who before her marriage was a killer. Anyway, he got the farm, but he now sells all his interests in Cramog to another John Cowley of the Close. And we know that John Cowley Cramog had lived at Cramog, but he's now living somewhere in German parish around Peel. How do we know this? Well, we're directed to look at these transactions by entries in the manorial rolls. In Lib Asset in 1750, we're told to look in Lib Vast in May 1756, and I've copied this for you here. You can see details of the marriage settlement and the sale. The entry reads, the said John Cowley Cramig settled this three shilling rent on his son John, one half in present possession and the other half on his death by articles of marriage. And the said John, the son, hath sold his right to the said John Cowley close 
by D dated 20th July 1755, both confirmed by the officers, and the said Cowley Close is now entered for a moiety, which is a half. And the marriage settlement and the deed of sale are preserved in the archives in the Manx Museum in a series called Northside Sales. Going back to the manorial rolls, in Libasset in 1761 and 1767, John Cowley Cramig and John Cowley Close are each entered for a half of the three shilling rent. Then at the Sheeding Court in 1770, John Cowley Close is entered for the whole three shillings, which means John Cowley Cramig and his wife must by then have died. John Cowley Close is entered in Lib Ased for the whole of Cramag in 1783 and 1797. So by that time he'd owned the property for over 40 years. But then at a sheeting court in 1798, we see John Cowley Cramag dying and the three shilling rent passing to his son, John Cowley, <laughs> under John Cowley's will and another marriage settlement. <coughs> What's this all about? Who is this John Cowley Cramick? Is he the same person as John Cowley Close? Well, we don't know. But now there's a Cramick Cowley holding Cramick again. And note that the court accepts that the property passed by a will, so it's not being treated as inheritance land. We then jump forward to April 1864, and the Sheeding Court records the death of yet another John Cowley, and the entry of his son as heir at law. So it is being treated as inheritance land. And ten years later, in 1874, this son dies, and the Sheeding Court records his death and the entry of his son, John Cowley, as the right heir according to law. Now, by virtue of having been carved out of the common land, many intact farms were on the edge of what was called the King's Forest, and under controversial legislation in the 19th century, ancient rights over these common lands were removed. And in the redrawing of boundaries, many small farms lost unenclosed portions of land on which they had been paying Lord's rent. This happened to John Cowley Cramig, and as a result, the Lord's rent payable for Cramig was reduced from three shillings to two shillings and sixpence. We'll now have a look at... The close, which as you can see is this property here, shares a boundary with Cramig, but that boundary is the very deep Glen Cramig. If anybody's walked up there, um, they'll know it's quite difficult to travel between the two properties. Close is even more isolated than Cramig. The access track used to lead in across a ford on the Druidale River from the road from Brandywell to Balaf. It's on rough moorland called the Reest Moor, which is the most northerly part of Braddon Parish. This 63-acre farm was famous because of its association with William Cowley, a noted Methodist preacher known as Ilya McClose. Basil McGaw investigated the close in 1944 and concluded it had been used for mixed farming, including livestock and grain production, since at least the 18th century. Cramig was simple to trace because it was a single rent, but Wood's Atlas tells us that the close is made up of two intact rents. Number 17, two shillings and sixpence, and number 34, one shilling and fourpence. Again, taking these rents back through Lib Assets, this time in Braddon, I found the earliest entries. Robert Fletcher for the two shilling and sixpence rent in 1577, and William Cowley, for the one shilling and fourpence rent in 1703. In 1588, the two shilling and sixpence rent passed to the influential Calcott family of the nunnery, where we are tonight. And in 1713, William Cowley, who presumably was the encloser of number 34, the one shilling and fourpence rent, he purchased the larger rent from Margaret Christian of the nunnery. This is the Braddon Parish map from Woods Atlas. It shows how isolated the close, right up there at the top, is from the nunnery right down here at the bottom. <coughs> 
As with Cramig, I've not found in the rolls any record of the actual enclosure, and we can only speculate why a leading landowning family such as Fletcher or Calcott in the south of the parish would acquire land such as the Close. But what we do know is that from 1713, when the two rents came together, right through to 1911, both rents have been entered in Libasset in the Cowley name and dealt with as one property. Again, there are Libvast entries dealing with changes of ownership. In May 1730, William Cowley, it's quite nice to have William for a change, isn't it? <laughs> William Cowley and his wife, both being dead, their son, sorry, it's John, was entered by virtue of a contract of marriage. In May 1734, John is dead and his son William is entered, and this is the famous Iliamy Close. In April 1834, William is dead and his son John is entered as right heir according to law. And we go on to 1857, John being dead, his brother William is entered, but he's also dead, so the younger brother Thomas is then entered. It was in the Lord's interest for both these devolutions to be recorded, as in each case there was a fine payable, one shilling and fourpence. But I do have to sound a note of caution here about relying on manorial entries to establish ownership to land. The purpose of the rolls was to ensure that the rent was collected. In 1847, the Registration of Deeds Act was passed requiring deeds to be deposited in a deeds registry. And there is, in fact, a deed recorded in 1848 which suggests land, including the close, was conveyed by William Cowley to his brother Thomas in 1847. Well, if that was the case, there wasn't any question of heirship. Thomas had already acquired the land and the proper course would have been for the deed to be produced to the court. By this time, close farm buildings were derelict. Thomas was living in Ramsey. This image shows the close farm in the early years of the 20th century, looking east, uh, with Cramig just visible there on the next ridge. I explained earlier how under the Real Property Act, 1869, all lands had become subject to arrest for debt. Quite quickly in December 1873, the close land was arrested by the coroner for Glen Faber under a number of executions against Thomas Cowley, and it was sold at public auction. It seems likely that the purchaser, William Cannon, was acting as a front for John Cowley Cramig. Some things don't change. For the land was sold on to John Cowley Cramig at the same price and on the same day as the coroner's conveyance to Cannon. And from that date, both rents were vested in John Cowley Cramig. But for some reason, he was only entered on the rolls for Intact 17, and Thomas Cowley continued to be entered for Intact 34 until the final Lib Asset in 1911. So, yet again, it's dangerous to rely on manorial rolls in later years as proof of ownership. I think what's likely is that John Cowley Cramig was paying all the rents for Cramig and the Close and providing the rents, which in any case were very small value by then, were being collected, then from the Crown's point of view, the correction of the rolls was no longer seen as important. This last John Cowley Cramig was my great-grandfather, my grandmother's father. He died in 1935. He'd married twice. All the children of his first marriage had emigrated, and his son of the second marriage, my great-uncle William, farmed all the family land, including Cramig and the Close. But he never married. Old John Cowley had made a will, leaving all his estate to William and his issue, but in default to his heir at law. And this was typical of Manx farmers. They believed that land should be kept in the family. As William had never married, when he died, in 1972, all the land passed to the eldest son of his half-brother, who had emigrated to Canada. In 1979, Cramig and the Close were sold to the Isle of Man Water and Gas Authority for the purpose of constructing the Solby Reservoir, ending after 400 years the connection of the Cowley families with these two intact farms. For those not familiar with landscape, this is Cramig down here. These are the Cramig fields, which are 
until recently were still grazed. Uh, and this is the way down to Cranwick from the Benny Park Road over there. The farm of Druidale, which I'm going to talk about now. Going back to the location map, you'll see Druidale is much larger than the other two properties. Woods colours it all as intact and gives the acreage as just over 726 acres. He lists it as comprising a property called Airy Hawkill, various numbered intacts and a mill rent. Turning to Libased, now in Michael, I found that Airy Hawkill is the name both of a treen, which is the final treen listed in Michael, and also the only quarter land listed in that treen. A number of writers have linked the term Erie or Airy with shealings or summer pastures and suggested they predate the development of mountain intacts. Here's Wood's plan of Michael Parish, which has been rotated so it lines up with the other maps with North at the top. And although Druidale down here shares boundaries with Close here and Cramick here and a couple of properties in Balaf, you'll see it's totally isolated by these high hills from the other Quarterland properties in Michael. Using the same process to examine entries in Libasset, I found that the intacts listed in Woods Atlas were added to the estate at various times. Intact number two had been associated with Airy Hawkill rent since at least 1554. And in 1869, intact 52 was described as a parcel of wasteland taken out of the Lord's hands at the ancient rent. And the final intact 55, a parcel of commons in the mountains of Michael and Balaf. The mill rent is quite interesting. In 1744, a governor's license was granted to William Kelly of Druidale and William Cowley of the Close to erect a mill on the Druidale River. And the site of this mill was surveyed in 1980 as part of the rescue excavation prior to the construction of Solby Reservoir. And it's evidence of the arable farming carried on at Druidale, Cramag and the Close and the self-sufficiency of these three farms. Now, Airy Hawkill is the last listed tree in Michael in the 1515 Northside Libasset. And you'll remember I mentioned Talbot's translation. Uh, here's how he translates this early entry for Airy Hawkill. From the wife of Reginald Wright with children for something. Demise to them five shillings and fourpence, that's the rent. And from John McQuine for a parcel of land, four acres by estimation, two shillings and fourpence rent, total rent of seven shillings and eightpence. So a bit like the close, there were two separate rents. The two shilling and fourpence rent passed to one Gilchrist Cannell by 1524 and then to Donald McKelly by 1568. The Kelly family were then entered up to the middle of the 19th century and prior to the modern name of Druidale, the farm was known as Erie Kelly. The one shilling and fourpence rent descended independently until 1670 when it was held in separate shares by three individuals. In Libasset for that year, there's a note, this five shillings and fourpence is declared and found to be intact and therefore not to be charged double as appears in the waste book. This is significant because it contradicts Shearwood, who maintained that land of one class could never be converted to another class, but here we have quarter land being converted to intact. In October 1834, the entire holding was bought by Samuel Brook and remained in the Brook family at the time of the compilation of Wood's Atlas. More recently, there's a tie-up with the Cowley family as John Cowley of Cramock took a lease of Druidale from 1893 to 1914 and took his family to live there. Druidale's the only farm of the three I've looked at to remain under occupation and cultivation today. Having looked at the three farms, I went on to compare them in terms of the Lord's rent paid. In this table, I've converted the acres, roods and perches from Woods Atlas into acreages to two decimal places. The rent for Cramig is two shillings and sixpence, as I explained, rather than three shillings, as the land surveyed in the asylum plan 
excluded that taken away under the Disforesting Act. And the rent for Druidale doesn't include the mill rent. The final column gives the rent per acre in pence. And you'll see Cranog and the Close are pretty similar. The Close is a little bit higher. That could be down to the rent for part of the Close having been fixed later. The rent per acre for Druidale is a lot lower, possibly because it includes land over the 1,200 foot contour, only suitable for rough grazing. In comparison, Cranog and the Close were principally arable farms and neither had any land over the 900 foot contour. The next step was to see how these intact rents compared with quarterland rents. So this enlargement of Woods Atlas for Lazare shows the quarterlands of Corridy and the Cregans. Corridy's named Cregans is the land alongside it. I selected these as they're the nearest quarterlands to Cramig and the Close. Cramig again down at number 57, not dissimilar size and lying at a similar altitude. Woods Atlas shows four owners, one of whom actually was John Cowley of Cramig. Each of them also held adjoining portions of intact, but the quarterland holdings are listed separately in the Gazetteer, so I could calculate the rents per acre just for quarterlands. <coughs> in this table, I'm showing the rents taken from Lib Acid in 1858, which is the last list before the asylum plans were prepared. I've done the same calculation to arrive at the rent per acre for each portion and then aggregated them to arrive at an average rent per acre for the whole of 7.82 pence. If we look at these figures in comparison with the two intact farms, you can appreciate the significant difference in rent. If you halve the quarterland rent to allow for the doubling under the Act of Settlement, you still have a rent nearly five times as high as the for quarterland farms than paid for the intact farms. <coughs> so the analysis has told us three things. Intact rents <coughs> per acre are generally not dissimilar, but they're much lower than quarterland rents on similar properties, and also quarterland rents per acre can be quite variable. I now want to turn to the third area. What was the status of the owners of these intact farms as compared with quarterland owners? We get some indication from the Isle of Man statutes in 1665. There was a reference to poor people as cotlers, intact holders, prentices and the like. And this act sought to give protection to these groups from being forced to work on the land of better off farmers. Intact holders are also referred to disparagingly in the statutes of 1679, which observed there's a sort of people such as cotters, intacts, and cottage holders, and who out of a covetous and unconscionable desire to injure their neighbours and to procure to themselves unjust and unlawful gain, do keep more cattle, horses, etc. than they have grass for. <laughs> Rogues. Outside statutes and the manorial rolls it's rare to find mention of intact holders so as to be able to judge their relative place in Manx society. But both civil and church records do shed some light on the question. The office of coroner is very ancient, being mentioned in the earliest recorded statutes of the island. I found two instances of John Cowley of Cranach serving as coroner for air sheeding. His name is included in a list of coroners in office in February 1828, and in that capacity, he was responsible for carrying out the execution of two convicted murderers. Cowley was not reappointed in July 1828, but he was once more in office in June 1831. But it would be wrong to treat these appointments as evidence of high standing. David Crane has described how, in the Stanley period, coroners were chosen from leading landowners. But in 1827, the low fixed pay often led to unsuitable candidates being appointed, a situation that was not remedied until 1855. And these years bracket Cowley's terms of office as coroner, so it doesn't take us very far on the question of status. We can get some insight into the relative status from records concerning the parish church. Seats were allocated in the old parish <coughs> church of Lazare, 
in 1708, preference being given to quarterland holders. Here's a plan of the church in 1766 <coughs> showing the allocation of pews. You can see the influential Milntown estate holding a, uh, occupying a spacious first pew on the south <coughs> side of the church. And even the relatively humble quarterland of Corrody at the head of Sorby Glen enjoys two pews, or half, two half pews, halfway down, uh, pews nine and ten. Poor old J. Cowley of Cramig is crammed with the other intact holders in pew number 19 under the balcony at the west end of the church. There was a vestry meeting in 1830 which resolved to build a new parish church, that's the current church, founded by an assessment of not more than £10 levied on each quarter land. Larger in tax, paying a large rent of 30 shillings, were to be treated as equal to a quarter land, and smaller in tax, mills and cottages, to pay a lesser contribution in the proportion their rent bore to 30 shillings. So pews were now allocated, one to each quarter land, and the intact holders were grouped as near as possible in 30 shilling parcels. So poor old John Cowley's three shilling intact rent would have entitled his family to a tenth of a pew. Not a lot of room in those days of large families. In 1770, money was left in trust to establish a mountain school at the head of Solby Glen below Corrody. The schoolhouse is still there. It's now a private home. But sometime after 1829, 12 landowners subscribed to the cost of a slate roof for the school. In this case, the intact holders, Cowley Cramig, Cowley Close, Quail, Block Airy, Kinraid, Kilabrega, Neen, Sherrick Vane, all contributed the same 10 shillings as the quarter landowners of Thalty Will, Corrody, Ballamenic, and Balaskelia. So this shows a marked contrast with the distinctions at the parish church, perhaps on mutual ground at the Valley Head, away from the influence of major lowland families, we're seeing a more egalitarian approach. And this interpretation is strengthened by records of the construction of the bridge across the Solby River at Thorsey Well in 1805. H.V. Hams, the president of the Antiquarians, wrote about this in 1984, and noted the leading role in this communal enterprise of John Cowley of Cramig. This table shows the number of days' labour the other surrounding property holders pledged for the building of the bridge, and there doesn't seem to be any distinction between quarter land and intact holders in the number of days pledged. Perhaps the highest status to which a Manx landowner could aspire was membership of the House of Keys. In ancient times, the 24 worthiest men in the island, the keys had by the time of the 1765 revestment in the British Crown become, in the words of A.W. Moore, a close corporation which was recruited solely from a few of the principal insular families. In 1866, following pressure from the Home Office, the House of Keys became an elected body but retained a high property qualification for membership. In the 1874 general election, John Brooke of Druidale was elected to the House of Keys as a member for the constituency of Eyre. It's tempting to cite this as an example of intact landholders achieving high status. But accounts of the election campaign show it was more the man than the land that was significant. Brooke was described at his nomination by his proposer, J.J. Quayle of Balaskelia, as a gentleman of wealth and position but at the same time not too high to speak to his inferiors, nor too low to be the equal of the best in the House of Keys. And it's probably also significant that Brooke chose to stand in the constituency of Eyre, where he owned Quarterland property, Balakelly, Andreas, rather than in Michael, where he resided in what was effectively an intact property. Going back to the Cowleys of Cramig, Census returns show the accumulation of land held by them in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In 1851, John Cowley was shown as a farmer of 100 acres. In 1881, this had increased to 167 acres. And it's important to note this is more land than just Cramig and the Close. 
No acreage is given in the 1911 census, but by then he'd taken a tenancy of the much larger farm of Druidale and moved there with his family. This is a studio portrait of the second family of John Cowley Cramag in about 1900. Even allowing that the poorest will dress well for a formal photograph, this is not an image of a low-status crofting family. So let me draw together the threads I've explored with you this evening. There can be little doubt as to the historic importance of the distinction between quarterland and intact land in the Isle of Man. Quarter landowners were the principal tier of the Manx population, and their holdings were accorded special status as lands of inheritance. The process of intacking from the 16th century allowed these holdings to be added to, as appears to have been the case with Druidale, but also permitted the creation of new farm holdings, such as at Cramog and the Close. Writers have suggested the Close dates from the 18th century and Cramig from perhaps the 19th century. But my researches show that parts of the Close and the whole of Cramig were taken out of the common land in the 16th century and were assessed to pay a significantly lower Lord's rent than the neighbouring quarterland holdings. It has previously been assumed that the ownership of the two distinct land holdings, the Close and Cramig, had descended from father to son as inheritance lands down to the modern era but my research has now shown a much more complex picture with the properties changing hands a number of times between the two Cowley families. It would be interesting to extend this study to other detached intact land holdings in the Solby Valley to examine when they were enclosed and to what extent they have been occupied for <coughs> long periods by the same families. And this would also give a wider sample of rents for comparison. The discrepancies I found between the deeds registry and the manorial records in the 19th century suggest that with the decline in the real value of the Lord's rent, less attention was paid to maintaining accurate details of landholders in the manorial roles. And this highlights the importance of examining all available sources, including transactions, wills and genealogical records, as well as the entries in the manorial roles. As we've seen in the 19th century, any remaining consequences of land being intact were swept away by legislative reform. And at around the same time, I've shown that the status of a landholder had ceased to be defined by the classification of the land he held, and it was rather how much land he held, together perhaps with his personal wealth, which had become more significant. I've chosen this picture to finish with. In fact, it shows none of the farms in the case studies, but it has the ruins of Killebrega, an intact farm in the foreground, and across the Solby Valley, Slumanic, an abandoned quarterland farm. By the early 20th century, practically all these upland farms had been abandoned. But visit these places today, and they do have a very powerful effect on you. You want to know who lived there, you want to know why, uh, and I hope I've answered some of those questions for you tonight. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions. If anybody has anything we would like to ask in the real estate <coughs> processing. Can I ask about the... the um, the intact rent, and surely you would think there would have been um, some moves to increase that rent down the years to turn it into something more meaningful. Why do you think that didn't happen? None of the rents changed uh, after the Act of Settlement, and in fact, uh, intact rents didn't increase as quarterland rents mm -hmm. increased under the Act of Settlement. Um, and the rents then became increasingly devalued as time went by. That's remarkable. Can't imagine that happening today. Mm -hmm. What effect would the disafforestation have had on the, um, the viability of these upland farms? It's a very interesting question, and it was gone into in some detail by a former student, Emma Mortar, who uh, published her dissertation on that subject. 
um, speaking about these properties in particular, um, I did find uh, a sale of sheep from these farms, um, and it actually said, um, due to the disafforesting legislation, it was actually quoted in the sale, and that was the reason for disposing of their sheep. So it certainly had an effect. Um, I think Emma's conclusion was that, um, although it was a factor, there were a lot of other factors. Um, in the case of Cramig, I've talked about the emigration, because the whole family left. And although um, when you visit these properties, as I say, they're very romantic, and you could picture yourself living there, it was a fantastically hard life. Uh, and it was very difficult to persuade young people to stay on the farms as soon as other opportunities became available. Um, and in the case of the island, uh, you've got to think about the mining industry. Um, at Corridy, the, uh, I noticed when I was doing some other research, one of the um, uh, miners killed in the Snaefell mine disaster came from Corridy Farm. So that was a son from the farm going to find another occupation. When the tourist industry took off, people were going into the tourist industry. These days, farms are going from farms into the finance industry. Um, so as soon as there are other options, um, life on a farm of this type becomes unattractive. So yes, the disafforesting legislation had an effect, um, but I don't think it was the sole reason. Chris? One question. A lot of these farms have gone nil, and yet the farms are worthless. How did they manage to get the nil on these places? How did they finance it? Yeah. Um, Larch Garrett did do um, an article on that, which, which is in the reading room at the museum. Uh, I can't recall the figure, but she, a farmer had actually given her uh, the bill for one of these horse mills. Um, and it was quite a substantial figure. Um, but uh, they all did invest in these mills. Um, I presume they were able to buy them on credit. Um, and whenever you wander around these, these Tholsons and the Manx Uplands, you always find the stone circle. Uh, and quite often the mill equipment is still in the barn. Um, there is one at Cramig, not one at the close, um, but there is a, um, a seed oven down at the close for uh, drying grain. And as I say, the close and uh, Druidale actually had a water mill, so there wasn't need for a horse mill there. Okay, one last question. Um, may I ask, when did the... Uh, I also heard a rumour that um, the last of the cowries with who actually owned the Cranach <coughs> was went to America. And then so when the when the uh, it was actually sort of all bought up up there by the government, um, that was quite easy. I think they just took it over because no one ever appeared with it. The the cowries the John Cowley there, when he looked very sparkly dressed for somebody living out at uh, Cranach. Um, when did they, 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 they actually cease to have uh, any of the cowries in it? Well, uh, he farmed it, but um, after he'd been at Druidale, he retired to the Cregan, which was, you know, where the Cregans is the next farm over. Um, and then Willie um, farmed it until shortly before his death. Um, so it was probably being, it was only being grazed, nothing more than grazed. So sheep were being run over all three farms, and still are. Um, but uh, when he died, the title to the land then went to the uh, family in Canada, and it was the son who left Canada and gone to America. So they sold it and received very little for it because it's uh, obviously very poor quality land. I, I heard that the, the crown was actually used um, as shelter for people going out for. Um, um, Lambing and things like this at, uh, hmm. for many years. Until so, quite late. Uh, right into the, uh, so we say, the mid and uh, maybe the, the 20s, the 30s, things of that nature. Yeah. The, the slide I started with, um, David Byrne did that in the 1980s, and there was still a roof on, although it was quite ruinous. Um, of course, it's gone downhill very much since then. As soon as the roof goes, these places go. Thank you. Thanks very much. Chris, um, you've done a fantastic piece of work here that I know will be of use to uh, future students and future scholars for many years to come. And I'm really grateful to you for agreeing to come and share that with us this evening. I'm sure you'll be happy to have a chat with anybody that wants to have a quick word sure. with you afterwards. Um, but thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you.